and uh, the surface temperature of Mars is uh, frigid, very, very cold. In the contentious debate about man-made global warming, all sides agree on the physics of the greenhouse effect. It can even be demonstrated in the lab using a FLIR thermocam, a special infrared camera. So we're going to demonstrate to you how the CO2 absorbs the infrared radiation, which causes the Earth greenhouse effect. Infrared radiation is another word for heat radiation, which is coming off my face, and which is picked up by a camera that I'm looking at. The camera is, is sensitive to heat radiation. Between me and the camera is a volume that we will fill with CO2 gas. And as we turn on the gas, my image will slowly fade. This physical property of CO2, known to physicists for a century, is the bedrock of the concern about global warming. Because the ordinary air in the tube, composed mainly of nitrogen and oxygen, does not block infrared radiation, the camera sees the heat coming off the scientist's face clearly. And as we turn on the gas, my image will slowly fade. But when the tube is filled with CO2, or any greenhouse gas, their molecules absorb the heat radiating off his face, blocking its path. As less and less heat reaches the camera, the image fades. If the scientist were surrounded on all sides by CO2, then the effect would be for him to get warmer, like the Earth in space. Today, the atmosphere is sampled at many sites on land and sea. Flasks are filled and sent to central laboratories, like the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Lab in Boulder, Colorado, to be analyzed for CO2 and other greenhouse gases. Even though most of the CO2 is put into the atmosphere in the industrial northern hemisphere, analysis reveals it pretty soon shows up everywhere. If you burn, uh, say, a gallon of gasoline that's turned into CO2 molecules, it will spread throughout the entire atmosphere. So what you burn today in, in your car will show up in Antarctica by next year. The other important fact scientists have discovered about CO2 is its permanence. Unlike water vapor, which stays around only for days, CO2 remains in the atmosphere for on average 100 years before being absorbed by the oceans. Our CO2 emissions are therefore changing the atmosphere, not just for us, but for future generations. The measurements at Mauna Loa had produced clear evidence that humans were changing the composition of the atmosphere. But the data went back only 40 years, while we've been burning fossil fuels for more than 150 years, all during the Industrial Revolution. Just as scientists had used natural recorders to get at past temperatures, they now wondered if the giant ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica might have captured past CO2 levels during and before the Industrial Revolution. And what they found was remarkable. Trapped in the ice cores are bubbles of air time capsules preserving the atmosphere of the past. With care, these bubbles of fossilized air can be analyzed for carbon dioxide and other gases. Sensitive analysis of the air bubbles reveals that before 1957, the atmosphere had less CO2. Indeed, CO2's rapid rise starts at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Subsequent research has ended the curve far back in time. It's now established that current levels of CO2 are higher than at any time for the past 450,000 years. 
when you look at a 450,000 year record and, and the last 100 years, uh, 150 years stands out like a sore thumb, there's not much question that we're, we're involved in some way or another. And, and, and surely that's not surprising. I mean, we are such an incredibly powerful force on this planet, our species. I mean, most of the land area of the Earth that is habitable, that is cultivatable, we've cultivated or we've inhabited. Uh, we, we've moved mountains, we've redirected rivers, uh, uh, we, we've mined all this coal. We're, we're a global force. I have no doubt that an increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere should lead to some increase in global temperatures. The question is how much? And how can we be sure that any temperature increase that we do find in the record is in fact due to this additional carbon dioxide? Since we know that the climate also changes naturally, it warms and it cools, how can you distinguish a warming produced by an increase in carbon dioxide from a warming produced by some other cause, let's say by the sun? The argument that fossil fuels are changing the climate has alarmed coal, gas, and oil producers. Because so much is at stake, the energy industry have been following the scientific arguments closely. I understand that people get uneasy over the concept of more CO2 going in the air, but you can't live your life based on speculation. And we know today that using fossil fuels is a good thing. It leads to economic growth, it allows more people to live longer on Earth. Uh, these are, there are positive goods that come from using fossil fuels. There's a speculative bad that people are holding out there saying, therefore, let's stop using fossil fuels. And I think that's an imprudent approach. The coal industry has mounted an aggressive challenge to the whole idea of human-induced climate change. Its high-powered public relations campaign argues that CO2 has been unfairly characterized as a pollutant. In the past, we've had these great struggles over pollution in the United States. Uh, sulfur dioxide is a pollutant. Uh, NOx is a pollutant. Carbon dioxide is a benign gas required for life on Earth. Uh, it is not a pollutant. It is not regulated. Uh, there are no state laws uh, uh, dealing with CO2. There are no congressional laws uh, that give the, any, an agency the right to regulate based on CO2. Far from being a pollutant, the coal industry argues, CO2 is a powerful plant fertilizer. So producing more of it will green rather than pollute the planet. Its video, The Greening of Planet Earth, maintains that industrial CO2 will fertilize the Earth, and the enhanced forests will eventually soak up the excess greenhouse gas. Grasses will grow where none grow now, and great tracts of barren land will be reclaimed. It argues that horticulturalists pump CO2 into their greenhouses, five times current atmospheric levels to make the flowers and vegetables grow faster. And indeed, the plants thrive. The industry believes that characterizing CO2 as a fertilizer rather than a pollutant turns the controversy on its head. The only thing we are concerned about is carbon dioxide levels becoming too low. Because if carbon dioxide levels were to fall below, let's say, one half of the present level, as they almost did during the last ice age. If they were to fall below one half of the present level, then plants would be in real trouble. After all, carbon dioxide is plant food. Without carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, plants would disappear. While it's accepted that CO2 is a plant fertilizer, it's not known just how the world's forests will react. Will they be able to keep up with ever-increasing CO2 emissions? In a remarkable series of federally funded experiments, scientists are trying to test the greening hypothesis. In 50 years, if current trends continue, CO2 concentrations will be double the pre-industrial level. And that's just what this forest is getting. Our experiment is an attempt to grow an entire forest at 560 parts per million. In other words, we're replicating the growth of forests 50 years from now around the world when all forests will be bathed in that atmosphere. 
We're essentially jetting CO2 into the forest. Doing science on this scale is a massive undertaking. Each of the experimental plots consists of a row of towers that inject carbon dioxide 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. As the trees grow, carbon dioxide flows in and out of the forest. Some carbon getting locked up as wood, some decaying back into the atmosphere. So everything in this forest of the future must be carefully measured. Only two years into the experiment, the scientists can already see some changes. As a result of the first two years of the experiment, 1997 and 1998 growing seasons, we found a 25% growth rate increase in the loblolly pine and the, it exposed to high carbon dioxide in the forest. Whether or not that continues is a real source of interest to us. So is the coal industry right? Will this enhanced growth help suck up the excess CO2? Only, say scientists, if the CO2 stays out of the atmosphere. A forest might sequester CO2 for 50 years, 100 years, and then at a certain point, it comes more or less into balance because enough organic matter in the forest has been built up that decay starts to catch up with photosynthesis. If we chop down the old tree, we have to make sure that most of that tree is put into a usable product that has a long life. And what happens then? Eventually, the lumber rots or gets burned. Eventually, within a century or less, the carbon locked in wood will find its way back into the atmosphere as CO2. And there's another reason for believing that plants alone can't absorb all the CO2, the vast size of the fossil fuel reserves. When you look at the amount that is potentially available in coal, it's such an overwhelming amount. If you were to store all of that in plants, the terrestrial biosphere would be four or five times the mass that it is now. It's hard to conceive that how plants could keep this up, uh, you know, over centuries. But even without the greening of planet Earth theory, the fossil industry is unwilling to concede that increased CO2 will translate into major climate change. There are reasonable people that have speculative fears about more and more CO2 going into the air impacting climate. But there is no basis, no mechanism that anybody can point to or look at to say that more CO2 in the air is going to lead to catastrophic global warming or apocalyptic global warming as opposed to some mild warming, uh, which is nothing to be concerned about at all. It's not disputed that CO2 levels are a third higher today than before the Industrial Revolution and will double and perhaps triple in the next 100 years. The real crux of the issue is how precisely this rapid rise will affect the Earth's climate and whether those changes will be bad or good. The National Center for Atmospheric Research NCAR in Boulder, Colorado, is one of the world's top centers for climatology. Inside, there are scientists whose job is far harder than any weather forecaster. 